Good evening, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Reawaken Your Brilliance. So I was thinking, tomorrow it's three weeks from Thanksgiving. Can you believe it? 2012 has flown. But with the holidays coming up, no matter what you celebrate, Hanukkah, Christmas, Kwanzaa, that always means a ton of food and someone that drives you crazy. So self-care is very important during this time. So now is the time before we get into the thick of the holidays to really think about what you want, what's important, who to say no to. I was talking with our guest earlier this week. I was like, I'm sorry, it's kind of crazy. And she said, sounding out of balance. And I said, yes, I am. And I know I am. And I just really, it's important to remember to have good self-care. So I want you all to think about that with the holidays coming up to remember good self-care. So I'm going to tell you about tonight's guest. Jennifer Spain is a practitioner of Chinese medicine in Raleigh, North Carolina. She received her training at the Five Branches University in Santa Cruz, California, widely considered to be one of the best programs in Chinese medicine in the country. She is nationally board certified in oriental medicine, acupuncture, Chinese herbology, and Western biomedicine by the National Certification Commission for Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine. She is licensed in North Carolina and California as a primary care provider. Jennifer has specialized training in five-element acupuncture, a unique system of diagnosis and, diagnosis and treatment that excels in addressing imbalances and blockages at the mental, emotional, and spiritual levels. Jennifer strongly believes in the innate wholeness of each individual and the intrinsic healing capacity that lies within all of us. She has a genuine desire to see every patient fulfill his or her highest potential in life and enjoys being a part of each patient's individual journey. Welcome, Jennifer. Hi there. Thanks for joining us tonight. I know we had Jennifer was going to do this from her office and she now knows it's a little crazy with the connection there. <laughs> So yeah. raced home. Oh, good to know. Good to know. <laughs> so we'll know for future reference. So thanks for being a trooper and speeding home. And thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be on the show. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And so let's jump right in. Tell us about, and let me just ask right off, should I refer to it as Asian medicine or Chinese medicine? Or are they kind of interchangeable? Or what's what's the word on that? So they are definitely interchangeable okay. and <clears throat> I go back and forth. I use them both, but I do, I think Asian medicine is a little more all encompassing okay. because there are Japanese traditions, there are Korean traditions, um, there are, are all different types of medicine from different parts of Asia. So it's a little more inclusive, but that being said, Chinese medicine is moreover the, the most common thing you're going to run into. So. They're, they're interchangeable. Okay, that's good to know. I just want to, because I thought, gosh, I'm looking at my notes and I've written them both ways, so I should yeah, probably ask you about that. <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the history? Like, it's been around for what, like 5,000 years, and maybe, and correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't Ayurveda and Chinese or Asian medicine kind of start out and then they took a little different path? Were they kind of the same thing? They're very similar. They are, well, you know, they're similar and they're different. They have, um, in common, there is this idea that there is a root imbalance in the mm -hmm. body and, and it's somewhat based on the constitution of a given individual. And so each one of those types of medicine approaches that in a different way, in the way that is their specialty of, of looking at, at things. Um, Chinese medicine does have a 5,000 year history. And it's an interesting history in that it's really been an accumulation of knowledge throughout time. So, you know, Chinese medicine in its current form did not exist the way it exists now 5,000 years ago. It's um, been added to by various practitioners throughout the years that have found things to be useful, things to be helpful, and the things that have been the most helpful and the most useful have st stuck around. And... Today, we're left with a very powerful form of medicine that has stood the test of time for mm -hmm. thousands of years because it works. And these are all, you know, experientially based forms of treatment and forms of care. It's not, you know, there is a very theoretical component to Chinese medicine and you can go there with the philosophy mm -hmm. and the theory, but it's really based on experientially what works. And that's why it is still around, I think. So I found a great quote, and this probably was from your site, 
but it said Asian medicine views the person as an energy system in which body, mind, and spirit are unified, each influencing and balancing the other. Can you discuss this a little bit and maybe give people uh, and how that would view that would be different from, say, traditional Western medicine? Definitely. Um, traditional Western medicine, I'll just start there, it, it kind of compartmentalizes the body. So it sees a symptom and it sees that symptom in isolation from the rest of the system that it's happening in. So say you're having um, reflux. Mm -hmm. the, the Western physician is going to look at that as a symptom of an upper GI imbalance and just treat the symptom of reflux by diminishing the acid in the stomach and leave it at that. Chinese medicine, on the other hand, is going to look at why is reflux happening in this particular person? What is the landscape of this individual and why is this pathology happening? And it so, could be different. So for instance, yeah. what is acid reflux, if you're looking at the whole picture, might be different for me than it would be for someone else. Exactly. So that's why you'd look at the total body, whereas if I'm understanding you correctly, Western medicine's like, here, have a Prilosec. Exactly. Instead exactly. of being like, wow, because like, I, I know I had acid reflux once in my life, and I, I know for me that was personally due to too much stress. I mean, I don't care what they say about anything else. I know that that was the case for me, but for someone maybe if I, that they might not have enough acid correct or something like right. that okay it can go so. either way it can be a, an excess or a deficiency of stomach acid and so when you're uh when you're with someone and diagnosing them so you're going to look at the entire body and see how they fit in together could you uh either give us another example or talk a little bit more i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you i just wanted people to understand so or go into detail about like acid reflux and what could be caused by that so there, there are a lot of different things, as you already mentioned, and it's really important as to why it's happening in that particular system. And so, you know, the, the one major variance, as you already mentioned as well, there can be an excess of stomach acid mm -hmm. that's actually coming up the esophagus and causing burning and reflux. Or there can be a deficiency of stomach acid and then the protein that somebody eats is actually putrefying in the stomach and causing the, the stomach putrefied um, odors and juices to come back up the esophagus. So in that case, you want to give somebody a hydrochloric acid supplement mm. to actually help with the protein digestion and prevent that putrefaction from happening rather than um, prevent acid from being produced altogether, which is just going to exacerbate the problem for that individual. In Chinese medicine, stress very much is seen as being a precipitating factor for reflux, and it's a liver-stomach imbalance in Chinese medicine where the, the stress hits the liver system, and the liver system attacks, we call it, the stomach and the digestive system and causes the qi of the stomach, which is supposed to go down, to actually flow rebelliously and come back up. Now, why did you say liver system? Like I, the system, because I don't think a liver, I think, well, it's just a liver. I can get digestive system like, OK, well, I know there's a couple yeah. parts going on in there, but why would you use the word system? So when we talk about organs in Chinese medicine, they are named after or when we talk about systems in Chinese medicine, they are named after organs. So we have liver, we have stomach, we have spleen, we have heart, we have 12 of these major systems in the body. And the organs are part of that system. So the organs are seen as an accumulation of that channel system's chi. So they're a large mass of that chi, a large mass of that energy. But the whole system, like the liver system, encompasses a lot of other physiological processes and a lot of other um, spiritual associations and mental associations even. So, for example, the liver is associated with the wood base in Chinese medicine. So that's its elemental relationship. And it's associated with the emotion of anger. Oh, I know that too well. Oh, unfortunately, <laughs> I know if I'm cranky, emotion. my liver, there's something going on there. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, that can be full-fledged anger. That can be kind of a simmering resentment. That can be... Um, the whole, the whole spectrum and continuum of things that are associated with that kind of frustrated lack of movement of energy. Um, that being said, also the wood phase 
where the, which the, the phase that the liver is governed by also governs the creative power, the vision that we have in our lives. It governs the eyes, uh, it governs the tendons. So it's about movement and it's a very powerful energy. So the liver organ is part of this system, but there are so many other things that are part of and influenced by and affected by the, the energy that's in that system. So that's why, why I use that word is because they're pretty big groupings of things. Got it. And then you mentioned chi. So can you explain to people who don't know what chi is and what role it plays in Asian medicine? Definitely. So chi is our life energy. It's akin to what they call prana in mm -hmm. Ayurvedic medicine. And um, it is the, the substance that, that contributes to our body being what it is. It runs all of our, at least according to Chinese theory, it runs all of the processes. It gives us our life's breath, essentially. And it runs primarily in the meridians that we treat with acupuncture and herbs and the other modalities that we use in Chinese medicine. Um, it actually, there's, there's different levels of qi and that gets into a lot more theory, but the primary meridian qi is what we work with um, a lot in Chinese medicine. And... Can you tell us what a meridian is for people who don't know what that is? Sure, and I actually have a visual aid. Oh, good, I love visual aids. Oh, awesome. Hello, acupuncture man. <laughs> acupuncture man. And, um, and you can see, I hope you can see that uh, some of the, the lines are, are coming through. But these are the pathways that the chi runs in, in our systems. And, you know, this is one of the things that hasn't changed about Chinese medicine over the 5,000 year history that it has. There are certain truths that are encompassed in this medicine. And the way these pathways run is one of those things that has not deviated. There, there have been additional pathways added and different interpretations of what's happening in the system. But these lines represent um, knowledge that has been accumulated as far as how energy is flowing. And they're, they're electromagnetic resonance, essentially, is what they are. And <clears throat> the points that are along these lines are... The acupuncture points are areas of decreased electromagnetic resistance. So they are the areas where we can actually go into the system and access because there's less resistance pushing energy away from the system. We can go in and influence the flow in the body and help to create a more harmonious pattern of flow because the idea in Chinese medicine is that it's all about flow. When things are not flowing correctly, we get symptoms, we get disease, we get pathology. And as long as everything is flowing okay, we're fine. That's right. And I want to remind everyone, if they have a question for Jennifer, you can call in at 919-518-9773. I know we have people across the country and internationally, if you want to save a dime, which I would want to do, you can Skype in at Computers 2K Voice to ask a question. I'm also monitoring the chat room. So if you have a question for Jennifer, please go ahead and ask. So Jennifer, I'm curious, what kind of diagnostic tools? So if someone comes in and says, okay, hey, I've got some issues going on. What would, what would they experience with you? Do you have a questionnaire? What kind of things do you ask? I do. I have a pretty significant questionnaire. It's a five-page questionnaire that I have a patient fill out prior to coming to visit with me. And that provides me with a lot of information. So during the first visit, we're definitely going through all of that information and I'm asking additional questions that get triggered by what I'm seeing on their intake form. And so talking is a large part of the intake. During that talking, I'm also looking at things um, on the patient. So I'm looking at the color and the luster of their skin, the luster of their eyes, their hair, their nails, there, there are certain things that give me a lot of information. And the tongue, do you things. check out the tongue? Yes, yes, definitely. We look at the tongue, um, take the pulse, and the pulse is a pretty large part of diagnosis as well. There's nine pulse positions on each wrist, and they all correspond to different organ systems, different levels of the body, um, 
we're looking for, you know, more than rates. We're looking for the way things are flowing in relation to each other, as well as the quality of how things are flowing in the vessel and the quality of the vessel itself. And that can give us a lot of information. Um, palpating the channels, actually touching the channels on a patient's system or a patient's body to see how they feel gives, gives a lot of information too. So sometimes the line of a channel will be very mushy, very um, soft, and will give way under a thumb very easily. Sometimes there'll be a lot of resistance. Sometimes mm. there'll be a little gummy um, areas in there. And the different qualities along the pathway of a meridian can give a lot of information about a patient's system too. So there's a lot of objective diagnostic tools that I use as uh, an Asian medicine practitioner to really figure out what's happening in someone's system. And that's what it's all about, is finding out mm -hmm. where things are not flowing well enough, where there's stagnation, where things are stuck, where things are in too much, um, in excess, in too much accumulation. And and just kind of balancing all of that out so that we get harmonious flow restored to the system. Fantastic. And I also want to note something that Jennifer does that um, I know for a fact not everyone does is when you see Jennifer, you're the only patient that's with her. She doesn't have 10 rooms and is going from room to room and checking in. It's when, and that's correct, right? I want to make sure yes. I'm not, not yep. mis, mis speaking here, but her attention is focused 110% on you, which I, I just throw out there because I think we're going to talk later. Um, uh, uh, since Jennifer was trained in California, they have the highest standards, and, and so she is uh, practices those standards, which I think is important for people to know when they're, when they're looking for a practitioner. Can you talk to us about the five branches of Asian medicine? Yes. So there are five major ways we look at a system. In, in Asian medicine, and there is the the physical modalities like acupuncture, like cupping, like moxibustion. There is herbal medicine. There's dietary therapy, which is very close to herbal medicine. <clears throat> Food is really seen as therapy. Um, there is physical touch used in the form of um, twina, which is Asian medical massage. And there's a yin and a yang form of that. And then there's also the internal martial arts like Tai Chi and Qigong uh. that actually help a person learn how to move their Qi internally and break stagnations and create harmonious flow with their own practice of movement and um, training the mind. I just ordered a DVD on both of those. Sounds true. I got a catalog and they're having a sale and I thought, you know what? I'm going to check it out. So that's, that's good great. to know. Now I have a better idea of what I ordered. Fantastic. So you mentioned yin and yang. Can you talk to, to us a little bit about what that's what that means? Definitely. That is really one of the primary um, ideas in Chinese medicine. There's the yin and the yang. And these are the two major forces that we are seeking to harmonize. So we've got the yin, which is usually attributed um, to being a more female type energy. It's a very consolidated energy. It's dark, it's cool, it's moist, it has mass. Um, and we have the yang energy, which is usually associated um, as being more male. It's the, the energetic part of the system. So it's the, the energy, the metabolism, the, the processes that happen in a system. And so together, they form a, a living, viable system. The form and the energy come together to create the and, one. And they, I'm assuming, or wanting to know, can they kind of uh, go back and forth, kind of flow? Like, you know, for instance, sometimes when I'm out there doing business, I got to bring up a little more of the male energy, but when I'm in a romantic relationship, I hope I'm bringing up more of the female energy. I mean, that's <laughs> kind of what I'm, what I'm hoping that goes on. But then I'm curious if, for instance, if those are out of balance, you know, you've sometimes seen a woman that's very, very aggressive with your characters, male characterizes being a little too masculine and the same with some men, you might like, Oh, they're just a little too feminine. Is that if there's a huge imbalance, is that something you might see? It can, it can show up that way. It, mm -hmm. it can show up in a lot of different ways. And so 
something like that might be something that speaks to an imbalance. It might just be the way that person is. Mm -hmm. Um, Because, you know, yin and yang come in different balances based on a given system or a given person. And it's all about finding out what that um, perfect balance is for an individual. There's no real template for that. Got it. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. Now, yeah. I've been dying to know, and I'm going to mispronounce a couple of these, but let's start off with one I can pronounce. What is moxibustion? So moxibustion, I have another little bit. Oh, yay. Here. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> this is a moxibustion stick. This is actually the smokeless form of moxibustion. What moxa is, is it's mugwort. And you can actually burn the, the herb mugwort, or you can burn a stick of um, wrapped mugwort, or you can burn mugwort charcoal, which is what this is. And I, I use the smokeless um, sticks in my clinic because they they give less smoke, they're, they're less um, irritating to people with allergies or asthma and things like that. So they just, they're a lot nicer in, in the clinic environment. Um, but I do use direct moxa too of a very high grade, and I don't have that with me. And um, that creates a very clean smoke. And we use it in very small amounts, so that's fine. But what moxa is good for, it burns infrared. The What we do is we light this stick like a stick of incense, and then we actually um, hover it over the body about an inch away from the point we're trying to activate with the moxa. The belly is a really common place where we'll use moxa. The low back is a really common place. Um, it's really good for warming the organs. It's good for creating flow. Um, moxa is one of the very few herbs in the Chinese pharmacopoeia that goes to all 12 meridians. So herbs tend to have affinities with certain meridians, and you know some will go very strongly to the heart, some will go very strongly to the spleen. Moxa goes very strongly to all 12 channels. So it's very mobilizing, it's very opening, it's warming, it moves things very so well. can you give us, well, first of all, what's mugwort? That sounds like something out of Harry Potter is there, <laughs> know, which is it? awesome, no. but <laughs> and is it an herb? I mean, I can see your stick, but I'm curious, what is it, it, is, it ground is an, or what? what's that about? So it is an herb, it's a plant, and it's the leaves that are processed to turn into matzo. And it's a it's a process that I'm not exactly sure how they do it, but it's I think it's a rubbing process mm-hmm. that turns it into what's called moxa punk. And it is a powdery, kind of grainy, fluffy substance that has a lot of essential oil ah. um, component to it. And it's partly partly the essential oil that helps to um, bring the medicinal quality. Can you give us an example of what you might be treating someone for that you'd be like, oh my gosh, this is really good to use? So one of the the great things is cold in the digestive system. And cold in the digestive system in Chinese medicine can manifest in a lot of different ways. One of the ways it primarily manifests is chronic diarrhea and just chronic indigestion. And, and of course, this is very general, and these things can come from other, other mm-hmm. um, pathologies. But typically, you know, I'll, if, if signs are pointing to something being very cold, if someone's very pale, if their hands are cold, if their feet are cold, if they're not digesting food well, I'll typically actually test the temperature of their abdomen. And very often, there will be a place on the abdomen either below the, the belly button or above the belly button that's actually physically cold to the touch and more cold in comparison to other spots on the abdomen. So, for instance, I have really poor circulation in my hands and feet. As we're sitting here, my feet are cold, my hands are doing okay. So is that something that I might benefit from doing that? Potentially. Now, I know you'd have to diagnose and check out all the other stuff that's going on with my body, but potentially it could be. Okay. Potentially, Yeah. And so moxa will bring warmth and um, freedom of movement to the chi in that area that gets stagnated by cold. Because cold stagnates flow. Heat can stagnate flow too, though, and cold hands and cold feet can be caused by too much heat, um, locking the chi internally so it can't flow. Interesting. But I don't have a cold heart, so all is not lost. (laughs) You don't. You definitely don't. Now, I want to remind everyone, if you have a question for Jennifer, we've got the expert on tonight, so don't hesitate to ask. You can call in at 919-518-8800.
nine seven seven three or skype in is computers 2k voice and i'm here monitoring the chat room so please if you have a question don't hesitate she will answer and she does not bite <laughs> now then ask questions good questions yes we, we want to that's why we have her here so we want to help you get your questions answered and i do not know how to pronounce this next thing what is i'm going to try yin tui na good job oh, yes good. yin tui na so that is um, part of the, the Asian um, physical modality idea that we were talking about earlier. And the, the yin form, so twina, is Asian medical massage. Um, the yang form is probably what most people are a little more familiar with. It's very vigorous massage. Mm. It uses a lot of pressure points. It uses a lot of very strong joint mobilizations. And the yin form is the form that I practice, um, which is actually a more rare discipline to find practitioners that practice that form. And what it is, it is um, a, a modality that I use my hands, but it's not really a massage. Uh, the idea, it's a little hard to describe, but it, it's very much about relieving the body from um, the effect of gravity and other forces that require its attention on a daily basis. So if we think about our body as an electromagnetic system, it's constantly resisting the force of gravity, the force of air around us, and working to maintain the integrity of that individual unique system that we are. And, and things can, can show up in the body that just get stuck in a place, and they're not able to process out because the body's too busy you know, maintaining homeostasis for mm -hmm. itself. And so by putting hands around an area that is <clears throat> stuck or injured, um, Yin Tui Na works especially well in old injuries that haven't fully healed. So there's not really anything um, specifically that needs to be treated in the area. You know, the, the lymph has moved out and the blood has moved out and there's no swelling and there's no congestion and there's really no you know, full injury in but, that site, but there's still pain. And there's or, or stagnant tissue. energy, maybe. Stagnant energy. Now, would and that so, also work on, say, an emotional trauma from the past? If it, was, yeah. if it was stored there, that that might be a gentle way to help release that? It does, and it's very powerful in that way. And, um, I mean, I've seen profound things happen in clinic with releasing emotional trauma through yin tui na. It's pretty incredible in that way. And it's so simple. It's, it feels almost like I'm doing nothing as mm -hmm. a practitioner. But by that, by kind of standing aside as the practitioner and not really asking the body to do anything in that moment except just be there, the body's healing energy can go where it needs to go most. And... And the body has the wisdom for this more than, than any of us do as practitioners. The, the patient's system knows how to heal itself. Absolutely. Now, I've always wanted to try this. Hopefully, I don't know if you have a demo for this. What's cupping? I do have a demo. Yeah. Oh, you're so good. I love this. A person that brings <laughs> toys. That was it. She was drinking from a cup. Yeah. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. So here is a cup. And um, these are the traditional glass fire cups. I have these in my office. I also have some of the more modern suction type cupping that doesn't require fire. These require fire, and that, that scares some patients <laughs> off. So I always explain what we're doing first and make sure that the patient is okay with whatever is going to happen. And we do what's most comfortable for the patient always. Um, but the cup, essentially what you do with these is you, you light a, a alcohol soaked cotton ball on fire and warm the air inside the cup and then place it very quickly on the patient's skin and create a suction inside the cup. And the suction works to mobilize the fascia, mobilize the underlying muscle tissue and really release blood, release lymph, release lactic acid, all the things that get tied up in the muscle tissue that can create pain and stagnation, the, the cup can help to suck those out with the, the suction. Now, would yeah. you do you do one cup at a time all over the body, or you place 20 at once? How does that work? We use as many as we need to use. And so often there'll be, you know, six to eight is probably pretty average. 
Um, if we're doing what's called running cups, which is where we lubricate the edge of the cup with a medicated oil, and then we actually um, adhere them with the suction to the skin and then run them up and down like the, the paraspinal muscles in the back to really release the back and um, reduce pain in the case of chronic back pain. That would only be two at a time, and it would be alternating side to side. But if we're just um, using stationary cups and, and adhering them to the body to work very specifically on one area of stagnation, there could be quite a lot on the body at once, as many as will fit, actually. <laughs> oh, I want to do that. That sounds really interesting. So it's like, oh. <laughs> and play with that. I think that would be fun. Oh, good. I've always wondered about that. Yeah. Um, and then, can, so that you said, so it's kind of losing the muscle or loosening the fascia and the muscle. So again, you like mentioned if someone had chronic back pain, what might be something else that someone might be uh, seeking treatment for that would benefit from that? So they're really good for respiratory ah. um, congestion too. <clears throat> so if someone's coming down with a cold or if someone has kind of chronic lung stuff, um, we can do cups on the back to help pull some of that congestion out of the lungs. Because it does, you know, that, that gets back to the whole idea of we're not just working on one level. Mm -hmm. We're not just working on the physical level when we're working with cups or when we're working with needles. We're working on all levels of the body. And so because everything is connected, we can really affect great change with these, these very simple things on the surface of the body. And then what is, I'll try this one, gua sha? Yeah, good job. You're I'm hired. <laughs> so gua sha is jade scraping. <clears throat> and here's what the scraper looks ah. like. Jade. And jade has therapeutic properties in and of itself, which is why jade is, is kind of the tool of choice for gua sha. It's very cool. It's very um, absorbing of toxicity. So by creating friction, what we do is we essentially scrape this on the skin like this. And neck is a really common place where gua sha is used. Really good for recalcitrant neck pain, chronic neck ah. pain. And um, we use a medicated oil to lubricate the skin and then scrape and create a sha rash. And that's where the, the sha comes from in the name gua sha. And it's a, a speckled purplish, um, almost bruise-like rash that mm -hmm. comes up. Uh, and that's good. That's what we're looking for with the gua sha. We want that to come up. So that, that means that we're releasing toxins when that exactly. occurs. Okay. Yep. You are tuned to Reawaken Your Brilliance on the Nissan Communications Network. We invite you to listen to some of our other programs like Computers 2K Now with Amna Nissan, Sundays 9 a.m. till noon. Attitude for Business with Mike Sink, Mondays 3 to 3.30 p.m. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Mondays 8 till 9 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch the program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. So you talked about using gua sha on the neck. Is there any, for neck pain, is there anything else that you've seen like, gosh, this comes up a lot and is good to treat it? That is really the majority of what I use gua sha for, and it works great on the neck. But you can use it on any area that has chronic pain. So I've seen it used on elbows and knees. It gets a little tricky, you know, with bones and um on non non level areas of skin mm -hmm. but that's where you know the gua sha and the cups are somewhat similar in their approach and that they're using or they're they're um, mobilizing the tissue to bring stagnation out and so gua sha can be very appropriate for areas where you just couldn't get a cup like it'd be pretty hard to get a cup on the elbow right but gua sha could be used on the elbow for things you know like um, tennis elbow or golfer's elbow or bursitis and just pain and um it would be very, very useful for that. And so if someone were to come and see you, you could do gua sha one day, cupping at their next visit. It's just whatever's in your arsenal and what they need is what you're going to use to treat them. Definitely. And often we'll do more than one modality in 
a visit. So I usually, on most, you know, 90% of patients, acupuncture will play a role in, in every treatment. Mm-hmm. But acupuncture combines very well with all the other modalities. So it's not uncommon to do acupuncture and cupping or start with a little gua sha on the neck and then have somebody lay down on the table and get some needles or mm-hmm. have needles in and, and administer yin tui na at the same time. So they work, they all work very well together and um, it can create a very synergistic, very strong effect Mm -hmm. and really help the patient heal a lot faster. So I'd like you to talk to us now, because I know you also do this about herbal medicine and I know you use a compounding herbal pharmacy and I would love for you, I'm a huge fan of compounding. So if you could explain to people what compounding is and how that's different from the pills they're getting at the pharmacy traditional pharmacy definitely so compounding pharmacies and even a western pharmacy um they're rare (laughs) they're hard to come by these days though we do have one um in the triangle and what a compounding pharmacy will do is they'll create a custom individual prescription that is based in dosage on your weight and your body type so a very precise match for dosage, which is a really important thing. They can regulate dosage. So, you know, the the pre-made pills come in, you know, standard dosages like five milligrams, 10 milligrams, 15 milligrams, and those dosages aren't always the, the appropriate dosages for a patient. So what a compounding pharmacy can do is create like a seven milligram dosage for a patient. And, and the herbal pharmacy works the same way. The, the reason I like using um, the compounding pharmacy is that I can have a full supply of the freshest, mm-hmm. most high quality herbs available to me and I don't have to stock stuff and worry about it going bad on my shelves. I don't have to make substitutions of an herb that might be okay, but it's not exactly the one that I want for a patient. I can just order the exact prescription that I want and the dosage that I want and have it drop shipped right to the patient's house and they'll have it within a week. And so there is a wait time there and that's, you know, somewhat um, ideal. It would be more ideal to be able to give it to the patient as they're walking out the door. But the benefits there, I think, far outweigh that delay. So and- can you give me a couple examples of what you'd use, herbs you'd use to treat someone with? Well, that's really, really variable. There are hundreds of herbs in the Chinese pharmacopoeia. And there are, you know, some common formulas Mm -hmm. that are common because they really work well and they're very widely applicable. And I do carry those in my office in what are called, um, in the form of what are called patent medicines. Mm -hmm. And those are just pre-made tablets that are very widely um, useful. And so one of the herbs I end up prescribing a lot is bupleurum, which is a, an herb that has an affinity with the liver system, and it really helps to move liver chi because liver chi tends to get stagnant. That's one of the primary <laughs> pathologies of liver chi. And um, that's a really common one. So I carry several variations of bupleurum type mm-hmm. formulas. And um, what are some of the other ones I like? Well, for instance, okay, so if you're treating someone and, you know, we've talked a lot tonight and learned that in Chinese medicine, you're looking at all the different systems. I could have a liver system imbalance. I could have a kidney imbalance. Could you say, okay, da, 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 and then say, send an order to the compounding pharmacy and get a couple different herbs together to have a custom treatment for me that would help deal with the different systems and something like that? And that, that's exactly what I do. I put okay. together formulas for patients that address exactly what they need to have addressed. So, you know, sometimes it's not a common thing that mm-hmm. a patient has going on. And, you know, common things happen commonly, which is why they're common. But it's, it's just as common, really, to have a patient who defies all the, the medical books that we study. And in that case, bringing in the the classical formulation mm-hmm. of a formula can really be a vast benefit to a patient. So definitely, definitely. So can you tell me, I mean, can you pretty much treat anything or are there certain things, you know, like, wow, I found that uh, using all these different uh, uh, Chinese medicines help certain ailments? 
You know, I think that Chinese medicine is so widely applicable that it's always worth a try if you are not getting results from whatever else you've tried or are trying. It, it has shown such benefit in so many situations. Um, that being said, though, there are... The, the one major thing I usually tell patients is that in functional type illnesses, and I distinguish functional from organic in mm -hmm. this case, that a functional illness is something that no cause can be pointed to as far as this is causing your symptoms. When there's nothing, you know, when you've done every test and when you've had all the labs and you've seen doctor after doctor and there's nothing that can be found and pointed to as far as something that's causing the symptoms that you're having, that's a functional illness. And that is really where Chinese medicine shines mm -hmm. because it works with the functionality of the body and having things function appropriately. And so things, you know, like irritable bowel syndrome, where there's nothing really that can be found organically wrong with the system. Oh, we have a question about that. Um, yeah. Great. It says, which you just started to touch on, have you ever treated irritable bowel syndrome in males? Definitely. And, you know, there's not really a huge difference between treating that in males versus females. It, again, comes down to that individual system and what's happening in that individual system. And irritable bowel can come from a lot of different places, too, as any symptom can come from a lot of different places. Now, but very successfully treated with Chinese medicine and definitely worth a try. Now, I know that everyone's different. Everyone's an individual. Can you tell people, you know what, generally it would take maybe you'd need to see me eight to ten times. Could you give a rough estimate so people are listening would have an idea? I mean, that, again, that might be too hard to speak to because everything is so individualized, but I'm sure people are wondering about that. It's, it, I get that question a lot, and it is, it's a hard question to answer. Um, typically what I tell patients is that the ideal way to go about starting with acupuncture therapy is to plan on between six and ten weekly sessions. And the thing that we're working to learn during those weekly sessions that we start with is how that patient's body is responding. So that's the one variable that I can't predict. Right. And through those weekly sessions, I'm getting feedback and I'm checking the pulses and I'm seeing changes and I'm looking to see how that patient's body is taking treatment, receiving treatment, what it's doing with the treatment, and how it's holding those, those positive shifts that we're making. And so in 90% of the patients that I see, after about six to eight treatments, um, weekly treatments, we'll be ready to start backing treatments off to bi-weekly for a month or two, and then leaving a patient either on monthly maintenance appointments mm -hmm. or seasonal maintenance appointments. Okay, this is a great segue because this is something I really wanted you to talk about. We've discussed this before. I know you're trained in California, mm -hmm. which is much more strict than North Carolina where you and I are located, but we have listeners all over the country. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about uh, regulations and ethics. I mean, again, California has the highest standards, which would be my hope that we would eventually have a national standard for this. Um, but how? what would you... Um, <laughs> How, what advice would you give to people to know that they are seeing someone that's being ethical? I mean, I shared with Jennifer, I was in a situation where, you know, 60 visits, that's what you need in addition to all this other stuff and, and, and a prepaid package. Now, that's fine in New North Carolina, but it's illegal in California, correct? Correct. So yeah. if you could talk a little bit about the ethics and what people can look for so do they make sure that they're, they're seeing someone... And Jennifer's very ethical, by the way, if you haven't, hopefully that's coming through, but it's why she's on the show. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing to pay attention to when you're looking for an ethical practitioner, I mean, there, there are licensing requirements, which I'll talk about in a second, but go with your gut. Mm -hmm. I mean, if something is seeming weird or seeming wrong, um, go with that. I think it's really important that that gets honored. And, and like you mentioned, you know, these package deals where you prepay for acupuncture is not legal in California. And, you know, that, that could be, 
here or there, but I think it's done to protect patients and make sure that patients aren't getting into a situation where they've already paid for something that they don't find value in. Uh, that's what and, happened to me. I mean, I ended up, I was like, it's, it hasn't changed. I do believe it helped me, but it got to a point where I wasn't seeing results and I had to, had to take it and, and deal with it to get my money back. And that was really frustrating because I'd paid out all this money and it wasn't, they, they didn't want to just give me my money back. I had to fight to get it back. So that was, that was very frustrating. And that's unfortunate. I think it's really unfortunate. And you are exactly describing the situation that hopefully no patient would ever have to be in. And the idea is, you know, if, if you pay as you go and you pay per treatment, it's always a, a good arrangement. You know, the patient wants to be there and they find value and they're willing to pay for that. And the practitioner has a responsibility to continue to provide service instead of being like, hey, I got your money and now I don't care about you as a patient, which I hope isn't happening. But it just eliminates that possibility. Mm -hmm. From existing and I think you're really right on always just in any situation not just in this to for people to trust their intuition because I didn't listen to my intuition but I'll, I'll give you a hint for all those listeners if you have a slick sales presentation you might want to run just yeah. a thought <laughs> just a thought yeah I think you know it's really that is the best advice I can give is you really do need to trust how you're feeling about something and that goes for any practitioners um, mm -hmm. or any anything in life in general it's just really important to listen to what your body and your your spirit is telling you about a situation it, it will not lead you astray you know mm-hmm and um, so about licensing, the one thing that you always want to look for when you're looking for a Chinese medical practitioner is the LAC, the Licensed Acupuncturist Designation. And that's because, you know, in, in a lot of states, and North Carolina is one of them, medical doctors and chiropractors and physical therapists even can practice a type of acupuncture mm -hmm. with very, very little training. And they are not trained in the diagnostic, um, the, all the diagnostic skills and all the theory behind the way we see the body in Chinese medicine. So a lot of my patients have tried some of these because the, the really sticky subject in that regard is that if you see a medical doctor in North Carolina that, that practices acupuncture, the insurance companies will actually pay for that mm -hmm. appointment, but they won't pay for a licensed acupuncturist. So patients are going to these places because their insurance is paying and they're not getting good care. And then they're like, oh, acupuncture doesn't work, but it's because they weren't really trying real acupuncture. Well, I have faith that we're moving in the direction of complementary medicines being more accepted. And, and I know there are insurance plans out there that, that are specifically for complementary uh, medicines. So if people want to buy a plan, they're able to do that. But, you know, I'm keeping the faith that we're moving more in that direction that, that they'll allow. I mean, you know, they've started like massage and things. So slow pace, but I have faith we're getting there. I do, too. And uh, <laughs> we are. It's just a matter of time. Now, I also wanted to ask you about, because I know you treat a lot of people with endocrine and thyroid issues, and the more women I meet, and, you know, I, I, it's been my personal observation that this affects more women than men, um, it, it seems to me that it's becoming more commonplace. So can you talk about the endocrine system a little bit and thyroid um, and how it affects your overall how, health and how someone you might help someone tackle this issue? Of course. So, yeah, the endocrine system is very complex, and it does affect our, our overall health in general. So we're talking about glands like the thyroid, the adrenals, the ovaries in women. And, and this is one reason why endocrine imbalances do tend to affect women a lot more than men is because of the menstrual cycle and the ovarian mm -hmm. involvement. Um, and they just, it's, it's just more common in women. You know, you see a lot more women with thyroid disorders and adrenal disorders. And it's just, it's very commonplace these see, days. I and personally, there, are, there are a lot of theories I have around that. Around I personally believe that a lot of that's due to the chemicals in food, the chemicals in the air and the water. I'm just, that's just my personal view that I'm convinced that somehow it, there's no way it can affect our systems. 
They do. They definitely do. And, you know, when you think about the endocrine system, it's a glandular system. So it's a very deep level process mm. in the body. And these toxins, they do, they get into that deep level and they kind of muck up the work. So that's definitely one of the reasons these things are a lot more commonplace these days. Um, fluoride, uh, you know, mm -hmm. that's in our drinking water has been shown to lodge in the thyroid and collect in the thyroid. So, you know, that's kind of a controversial theory, but... Um, there is some evidence out there for that. So, you know, these things accumulate over time. And as we've been in modern society, adding certain things like plastics and like fluoride and like um, artificial colors and preservatives to mm -hmm. our food, over the generations, these things start to show up as commonplace disorders that just get more common. And, um, and these are, the, the, it's a very large reason why these things start showing up. But, you know, disorders in the endocrine system are so widespread and they can show up in so many ways. Um, fatigue being a really, mm. really common way that, that disorders there show up. And we're talking about, you know, adrenals and thyroid. Those are two glands that work very closely to produce energy and, and stamina in our body. So when those are compromised or they're not functioning, we get fatigue, um, there can be weight gain, there can be things like infertility in women due to the mm -hmm. ovarian feedback loop of the endocrine system. Um, diabetes, of course, is an endocrine mm -hmm. disorder, and that has to do a lot with how we eat too, and mm -hmm. the sugars and the high fructose corn syrup that's added to, to all of our foods. and. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways it can affect the body. Now, I'm curious because we've talked a lot about how Asian medicine can help a lot of physical ailments. Can you talk a little bit about how it can help someone emotionally or mentally or spiritually? Definitely. I find that to be really um, one of the gifts of, of Asian medicine is that it can address this very subtle very esoteric level of the system and create enormous change and it's it's hard to know exactly what's happening there because we can't touch that mm -hmm. we can't really point to it but we can see the difference that happens and it's um it's very powerful in this way i mean i have seen patients recover from anxiety and depression mm -hmm. and post-traumatic stress disorder deep grief um it's it's all related and so as i talked about before each organ has this emotional correspondence so grief for example is stored in the lung ah. and the, the season of metal right now fall autumn is the metal season and the lung is governed by metal and so there's kind of this if we really sit with it there's somewhat of a melancholy kind of feeling in the air and it doesn't need to be sad. Um, it's very holy, mm -hmm. actually, as long as we embrace that and we work with it. But it can start to affect us pathologically if we take mm -hmm. that a little bit too much into our systems. And so balancing the lung chi and balancing the lung energy can really help transform that, that overabundance of sadness into something a little more um, useful and and um, helpful mm -hmm. and again holy because it's a very lovely thing to be in touch with absolutely in and i've always found and i truly believe this you have to whatever pain it is you've got to walk through the fire or you're never going to get it's always going to be there if you you know you think you suppress it or ignore it it's, it comes out one way or another so you've got to tackle it head on and i know i've worked through some some really traumatic things but i have to tell you being on the other side is much better than not dealing with it yeah so. exactly because that stuff it it stays in the body it's mm -hmm. not like it goes away if you're not dealing with it it's still there you're just not dealing with it exactly exactly but it, people think oh my gosh I'll, I'll die if i go through this but then you realize oh my gosh i spent all that time trying to avoid it and i feel it why it was difficult i mean in a lot of cases i'm not going to say uh you know it's easy but again the release the relief and just feeling much better having dealt with it as opposed to stuffing it down and all the all the problems that come with that. 
Exactly. Because that'll kill you too. I mean, holding it in is is going to be something that eventually takes its toll and sucks all your body's energy and um, is just as unhealthy and can lead to some really great consequences down the road. So a little pain now can really reap a lot of benefits. Okay. okay. We've posted your website, Jennifer, and if you have Thank a chance you. and can glance and make sure that we have that correct. I have my contacts in, so I can't see very well or type very well. Uh, we Oops. have ancientelementsacupuncture.com. Is that right? Yes. Fantastic. Um, so I have a couple more questions I want to ask you that are really important and really what drive me to doing this show. You know, a lot of people are struggling right now. And, you know, I really believe that sometimes the words of one person can truly make a difference in people's lives. So what advice would you say to someone out there who's struggling right now? What words of wisdom can you offer them? You know, the one thing that I think is really important for people if they're struggling is to do something to make a choice that is in your highest good and to keep making more choices that are in your highest good. It's, it's the only thing we can do. And whatever that means mm -hmm. for you as an individual, just to make a choice that benefits you and to keep doing it. And that is how we build a life that is truly, um, that truly flourishes mm -hmm. and that allows us to be the best person that we can be and allows us to be of service to others and and do what we're meant to do on this earth is, is for us to take care of ourselves first. And it's just, it's really important. It's it's the most important thing. And, and I would agree. And I think also people need to remember you always have a choice. Even if you don't make a choice, that's still a choice. Because people are like, oh, no, I can't leave my job. I don't have a choice. The economy's bad. Nope. You are making a choice. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And sometimes, you know, I see patients regularly whose job is killing them. And, and we talk about that. And, mm -hmm. you know, if they're not ready to make that change, that's fine. But it's important to make some small step towards making a change that can lead them in that direction to being more happy, to being more fulfilled, um, to getting out of a toxic mm -hmm. environment. And it's all, you know, that's part of the dance we do with mm -hmm. each patient is um, working within the framework that that person has because it's important that it feels right and it feels good and that it feels positive. And what one step can they do tonight, tomorrow morning? Can people out there listening do to reawaken their brilliance? What's your suggestion? <laughs> do something. <laughs> there are too many people doing nothing. Mm -hmm. That is that is not okay. Um, it's it's really the it's hard for me to say because it's so different for for any mm -hmm. any person. It um. It's really about what nourishes your soul and really makes you feel like you're taking care of yourself. That's the most important thing is mm -hmm. that to be of service and to give, we really have to be full and nourished ourselves. And we are the ones that can do that best for ourselves. It's, it's not something we need to wait for someone else to do for us. It's about finding out what we need, figuring that out for ourselves and giving that to ourselves so we can keep giving the world what it needs well as the sign in my mom's kitchen says if mama ain't happy no one's happy <laughs> yeah, it's so true it's so true and now, women especially we really walk this line between completely draining ourselves dry mm -hmm. and taking care of everyone else and what we need to realize is that when we spend every last bit of our energy taking care of others and we leave nothing for ourselves we're not good to anybody because we can't be of service to anyone if we're dry mm -hmm. we, need, we need care and nourishment too and it's you know we don't need to wait around we need to do that for ourselves so now i would like you to repeat for everyone your website again so they can find out more information about you and i don't know if you have any talks coming up or anything of that nature but please share your website or anything coming up that people might be interested in yeah so everything will be on my website i don't have anything scheduled at the moment um, but the website is ancient elements acupuncture.com and that's also the name of my practice and 
I, I keep it up to date. Um, I post blog. I try to post blogs regularly. I've been pretty remiss on that lately because I've been so busy. But um, I do keep events posted there, and if people are interested, you can subscribe to the blog and and follow me on Facebook and Twitter. And I try to post stuff there as well. Um, but yeah, online is is where. I post most of my information, so that's a good resource. Excellent. Well, thank you for joining us tonight, Jennifer. We truly appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate it. It was really fun. Good. I enjoyed it, too. And thanks for being a trooper and running home from work to (laughs) to set it up at home. So good. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Namaste. You are tuned to Reawaken Your Brilliance on the Nissan Communications Network. Listen to some of our other programs like Computers 2K Now with Omnon Nissan Sundays 9 a.m. to noon. Attitude for Business with Mike Sink Mondays 3 to 3.30 p.m. Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon Mondays 8 to 9 p.m. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch the program in its entirety or download an mp3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com.